Our final reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter, or sorry, cha- yeah, chapter 2, verses 40 to 52. It's on page 59 in the New Testament of the Pew Bible, if you wish to follow along again. Listen once more to the Word of God. The child, Jesus, grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when Jesus was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Child, Why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. This is the word of the Lord. The film Home Alone premiered on November 10th, 1990. I remember this was one of the rare times um, my mom and dad and I went to the movie theater to go see this. A lot of times it's kind of one or the other, or my brother or friends. Um, the premise, though, would seem impossible in today's world. Now, the Christmas comedy made Macaulay Culkin a household name and star. It sounds a lot like today's story from Luke, right? A large extended family plans a holiday trip to an out-of-town destination. Now, in the movie's case, the McAllister McAllister clan are traveling to Paris for Christmas. And along the way at the airport, uh, boarding the airplane all the way until they reach baggage claim. Everyone thinks that someone else has seen Kevin and everything's okay. Except they left him at home to, to fend off two bungling burglars. When his mom realized what they had done, she screams, she faints. Uh, and then there's a very underlooked part of the film, which is her journey back home, all the obstacles she has to overcome. Similar to today's text, when she finally gets there, everything was okay. Kevin's just sitting calmly at home like nothing had ever happened. But today, write a quick call, a text, um, opening an app, maybe like Life 360, would end the movie pretty quickly. Not to mention some ring doorbells, some inside security cameras. Surely, nothing like that could happen today, right? Let me walk you through my Thursday afternoon and some communications. Now, Colton's school dismissal is at 3.30. Hudson's is at 3.45. That afternoon, uh, Colton had a track meet in Fort Worth. And Chelsea and I said, we're going to divide and conquer this. I would take Colton to his meet. She would stay home uh, with Hudson. We didn't clarify necessarily how Hudson would get home for her to stay home with him. (laughs) I'm sure that's where I messed everything up. Uh, I got Colton. We're driving down I-20, going to the meet. And I let Chelsea know I was, you know, reaching my mom to, you know, get her to come over to help while she went to the carpet. All, all this stuff, right, to coordinate. Everything's going fine. Uh, I, I had received a, a phone call, so I had missed the, a certain text 
from Chelsea. And so I hadn't responded to that. So she called me, you know, seeing where we were. Well, it's obvious. We're going to the meet. Confused and a little panicked, she asked, well, you have Hudson, right? It was 358. I did not have Hudson. <laughs> we each thought the other was picking him up. Probably not, not the first time it's happened, right, Hudson? <laughs> Again, I'm sure it's my fault. Now, now, thankfully, neither of us were in Paris. Uh, there weren't bad guys that he had to fend off, and everything did resolve itself pretty quickly. But it was a classic fail moment while ironically preparing for this story of Jesus' parents losing track of him. How did this happen? How could this happen? Now, before becoming a father, I think I was probably way harsher in my judgment on Mary and Joseph. Now, I just relate to them. <laughs> This didn't happen because they didn't care for Jesus or they didn't love Jesus. Just one of those things, one of those moments. All right, so during this time, it was a common practice for Jews to travel to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, and they'd go often in large groups. All right, so here, right, friends and relatives, extended family, maybe close neighbors or a, a village would go together. And now that Jesus was 12, or a 12-year-old male, he was required to make the trip. And we can only presume from the passage that the celebration went just as planned. It all sounds pretty routine. It's time to head home. And so these large packs of, of men, women, and children would go in two waves. All right? uh, it was common for women and children to go off first because typically they traveled slower the men would leave second, and by the end of the day, they would catch up, and they would reunite, and they would camp and, um, you know, check on each other. And it's there, I'm sure, Mary asked Joseph, you have Jesus, right? With this picture in mind, it makes way more sense how all this happened. Joseph probably thought Jesus was with the other children off in the first group. Mary, maybe she was honoring Jesus now of age and thought he was traveling with the men in the second group. A whole day's journey outside of town. Surely their pace back was significantly quicker than how they left. But think about it from, you know, a parent's eyes when they returned to Jerusalem and how different it must have appeared. Right? The first time going for the, for the festival, you know, you, you're seeing the, the sights, the, the sounds, the, the smells, the endless array of, of celebration and things to be in awe of. But now, it's just an endless amount of threats and worst-case scenarios. We now know that, you know, that first 24 to 48 hours is critical in finding a missing person. And the first 24 hours was spent just backtracking. Once they arrived, they must have searched an abundance of places before ever thinking of checking the temple. I mean, that was a place for grown men to discuss scriptures and theology. Why would a 12-year-old go there? Well, because he's Jesus. He's the Son of God. Now, I know we have some 12-year-olds in here, and others maybe give or take a year. You know what's great about being 12? You know everything. <laughs> it's 
incredible. You're the smartest people in the world. And it's only because you just achieved the age of 12. Parents, teachers, coaches, pastors, any, everyone in authority, you know more than us. I remember being that smart when I was 12. But it all goes downhill from there. You've already peaked. <laughs> I'm kidding. What about preteen, 12-year-old Jesus? You've got the fully human aspect of, of hormones and awkwardness. Then there's the fully divine aspect, which includes things like omniscience. He really did know everything at 12. It's incredible. In this passage, Luke is the only gospel writer who shares with us a glimpse of Jesus' childhood and, and this preteen phase. Yeah, you can find other writings that were not included in the Bible that tell all kinds of fanciful stories, but they just were not deemed to be reliable, and they're not included in Scripture. But it's here that we hear Jesus' famous first words. And that's what we're focusing on this Easter season. In the weeks to come, we'll do our best using the Gospels to piece together uh, a series of his first words. And while it's not easy, we can, we can gather them in a good idea. Because we have to remember that the Gospels were not written as biographies of Jesus. Otherwise, it might be more linear and you know, similar in that way. The Gospels record the story of God's redemptive act of love through Jesus. So here we are in the temple, a boy among men. And it makes you wonder, when did Jesus, maybe like AI, right, become self-aware of who he was and whose he was? It's pretty fascinating to think about, right? We know that he grew up in a worshiping household. Jesus studied the scriptures, what we now know and refer to as the Old Testament. Mary and Joseph had done a wonderful job in raising and preparing Jesus for his ultimate calling as Savior and Redeemer. Here, perhaps, though, is that first look at preteen Jesus making that first break from his earthly parents. And as a mom and dad, it's no fun, but it's necessary. This brings us to a major question, especially for parents. Um, back in the 60s through the 80s, uh, you might remember some news broadcasts would lead off with something like, it's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? <laughs> parents, literally, do you know where your children are? We no longer, at least I don't, live in an age of just sending kids out to go play till sundown. Yeah, just come back for dinner. Yeah, we'll see you 10 hours from now. Go take care of yourself. But children still need increased independence. And that comes as mutual trust is built. And there's always that tension between control and permissiveness and some parents go all the way in one direction or the other and neither is healthy but do we know the video games they're playing do we know the music they're listening to the the apps they're using movies they're watching books they're reading it really is about knowing where they are literally and walking that fine line of control and permissiveness. Second, physically, do we know where our children are? Sometimes we think they're more mature than they really are. We expose them to topics and maybe media they're not ready for. On the other hand, I think more often in the case, we don't recognize them to be as mature as they actually are. 
One writer said, a strong temptation also exists for a parent to make his child become what he himself never was. The pressure begins in Little League, where angry parents may ruin a child's play. The pressure is in the classroom, where the push for academic excellence may cause a child to fail in needed social development. The pressure is on the future, trying to mold a young person into a vocation a parent may have desired for himself or herself, but was unable to achieve. So this means we have to know where they are not just physically in their maturity, but also their interests as they mature. It took Mary and Joseph a long time to go check the temple. Even though Jesus must have been showing strong interests and pursuit of his faith. Then third, spiritually, do you know where your children are? Now, while my calling to serve as a youth pastor ended years ago, I, I always loved going to church camps and conferences because those were special times. I got to experience incredible passion for God from youth. Their healthy zeal is almost always greater than adults in similar situations. Now, Kyle and Adrian are our professional staff for children and youth, but it's not their job to be the primary voice and influence in the lives of our children and youth. That falls on us parents, and they're here to support what we do Sunday at noon till Sunday at 9.30, 9.45 in the morning. Right? You've heard uh, Proverbs 22.6. Train children in the, in the right way, and when old, they will not stray. It's our job. So in this passage, we see where Jesus was, literally, physically, and spiritually. Those that heard him asked thoughtful questions, were amazed by him. But then it says Mary and Joseph were astonished. Craig Watts, in speaking to kids, says... When they saw that Jesus was not frightened or in any kind of danger, they got upset in a different way. Parents are like that, kids. Sometimes if they think you're lost or in trouble, and when they find out that you're all right, they don't know what to do first. Hug you or spank you for not listening to them in the first place. What did Jesus say? Mom, Dad, I'm sorry, I'll never do something like that again? No. What he said was, why were, you, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Or sometimes that says, I must be about my father's business. Jesus had left his parents and caused them a lot of worry by going to the temple to get involved in divine business, the family business. This lesson today is not just for parents or children. We all have to know where we are individually, literally, physically, and spiritually, because that is a reflection of the priorities in our lives. When our prior priorities are in the correct order, it's then that we experience a wonderful fulfillment in our lives. Verse 40 started with the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. And verse 52 ends with, and Jesus increased in wisdom in years and in divine and human favor. Jesus's priorities were in order, and he too enjoyed that sense of fulfillment. So Jesus' famous first words, Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? That's my main focus in my personal reflection here. When I examine the things that fight to reorder my priorities, I need to remember this. 
in an election year. Brace yourself, gird your loins. <laughs> when I'm bombarded with real and fake news from all sides, I need to remind myself, be about the Father's business. When there's denominational strife and I'm weighed down and I'm burdened physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, as I process and deal through it, be about the Father's business. When the Cowboys trade up in the first round and draft a running back, I really need to stay focused. <laughs> be about the Father's business. And just sometimes we need to remember that we can learn a thing or two from 12-year-olds. It's in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.